Today, you are going to get a front row seat to the short but impactful career of Springbok Warren Brosnihan. Warren, welcome to Front Row Rugby. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Great to be here. Great to be here. Well, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on the front row, I'll be honest, but it's uh, yeah, good to join you on uh, Front Row Rugby. No, it's great. And the point of the show is to get a front row seat. So it's okay that you were in the back row, Warren. Uh, let's start our conversation with a look at today's trivia question. In 2013, the Springboks played a test match at the Mbombela Stadium for the first time. Who were the opponents that day? Now, if you know the answer to the question, you can put it in the comment section down below. And we'll also find out if Warren knows the answer, but we'll do that at the end of our conversation. Warren, we are going to start not in 2013, but in 1997. Talk to me about how you were feeling ahead of your Springbok test debut against Australia. Oh, Peter, it's, uh, it is the most amazing experience. And uh, I guess for all uh, the Springboks that have become Springboks or someone that's gone to represent your country, um, the day of actually doing that is just amazing. It's something that you work at uh, or you you set as a goal at a stage in your life. And uh, you, you you might set that goal, but you're never quite sure whether you're going to reach it and achieve it. And when you get it, it is uh, simply amazing. I'll, I'll never forget the bus trip to Loftus first of all, to staying in Sandton as a team. And you're driving on that bus. And uh, obviously, I was a youngster in the team, or it was my debut. So, sitting in front of the bus, not in the back row, but of the bus. And, uh, you know, just sitting there and just pure silence on that bus as you're driving. And you've got the, you've got the, um, the police escort of the blue lights on the, on, the, on the motorbikes going in front and then going behind and getting you through the traffic lights. And uh, I said it was pure silence, but the, the one thing there was this doof, doof. Doof, doof. And this was because back in 1997, we didn't have these uh, fancy uh, headsets. You had these uh, had something called a Walkman that was on your head, and it was, and for whatever reason, James Small was sitting behind me, and he was listening to music. So I, I was like, look, staring out the window, watching these police uh, motorbikes go past, and I could just hear this doof 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 of James Small's uh, whatever he was listening to the whole way through to Pretoria, and then obviously. You know, when you get to the field, you get strapped up, you give your pre, pre-match pre chat, and then the, the anthem starts and you, you lined up and uh, the national anthem's playing. And uh, it's and, and to do it at Loftus First Fault, I mean, there, there are special stadiums in South Africa and Loftus First Fault has been one for me as well. It was just incredible to have my uh, my debut for the, or my starting debut or for the Springboks to start in your first game and play it at Loftus and then to beat Australia. Um, it was just sensational. And how special was it that you got to score a try that day as well? <laughs> oh, probably a little bit lucky. We 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 planned this we planned this move, um, and it was you know from a from a when we get to about the twenty two meter line to have a throw to the back of the line out, um, but we, we the line out would be shortened. So then we Gary Tashman and myself would be in the back line, and what would they do is just that we'd, we'd take it and drive towards the uh, the uh, the uh, rugby post. Um, and, but the two of us would stay on the on the blind side, and you know, the scrum off and the fly and the fly off would sweep around to the blind side. And then I, it was meant to just be a simple move where it goes from you know from fly off to Gary to possibly me to James Small who'd be on my outside. Um, and for whatever reason, Tosh started to drift across, and then I did like a scissors with him, and it was just. It, I didn't even think about it. It just happened. I don't know how it happened, but just and that's what happens in rugby. It just. You know, I just was scissored with him. He laid off the ball and we came on the inside and uh, the, a gap opened up. And I remember George Gregan trying to bring me down to, ta- to tackle me. And next thing I'm over the line, you've scored a try. And it's uh, and the, the, crowd, the crowd goes crazy. And uh, it's an amazing feeling. It really, really is. And uh, something that I will treasure for the rest of my life. Very special indeed. So Warren, we handed out a big hiding that day to the Wallabies, uh, an annihilation, our biggest win over them at that point, 61 points we put on the board. I'm curious to hear from your point of view, do you think that we were particularly good or that they were particularly bad or was it just one of those freak days that you sometimes get in sports? Well, the, you know, Peter, there's so many small little things that come into a rugby game. Uh, the, in the Aussies' defence, they travel all the way from Dunedin, uh, which is probably the longest trip that you can do in rugby before the game. So they played the All Blacks the week before, I think, in Dunedin, uh, and had to fly out for that game. The game was played at altitude. Uh, we had had a pretty tough uh, Test series. It was uh, it would it would be Coral Duplessis' last uh, Test match in charge. 
um, so the guys hadn't we hadn't won a game and we were desperate to um, you know restore a little bit of pride and all that kind of stuff. So you have all these intangibles coming in. I think it was uh, I think it was uh, Andre Juvenil's last game for the Springboks. I think possibly Henry Honeyball as well, if I remember correctly. Um, so there were a lot of factors at play, and these things they all just come together. And uh, yeah, it was it was an amazing game to be involved in, and uh, I was really privileged to have been able to run onto that field that day. You mentioned Carl Duplessis there. I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about him as a coach as you experienced him. Well, it's, it's, so Carl, number one, he, he was one of my heroes as a, as a rugby player. So as a youngster growing up, uh, it was like Rob Lowe, Carl Duplessis, Zin, uh, not Zin Zinbrook, <laughs> uh, Murray Nexted, and guys, uh, guys like that that uh, I really looked up to. And then for Coral to be coaching me when I when I got selected, the box was amazing. And uh, Coral is an absolute uh, gentleman, eh? so he he really really is. And uh, he, he treated all his players with the utmost respect. And uh, you know sometimes it's it's, it's very difficult. He, he never really had proper coaching experience. That got put into that Springbok job, and uh, probably needed a bit more time in the in the saddle doing coaching before being getting the big job of the Springbok uh, in that Springbok role. Um, but I will forever be grateful and uh, yeah, what a gentleman. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not consider becoming a patron? It's my dream, guys, to do this full time and with a small financial contribution, you can help me realize that dream. The link and the QR code is appearing on your screen right now and I'll also put it down in the description area for you to go and click on at a later stage if you would like to do so. And by becoming a patron, I promise there will be great benefits for members. Now let's get back to the interview. And then you had to wait another three years before you played a test match for the Springboks, Warren. What happened? Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, there I, was, I was playing, it's, I changed over, went back to the Sharks in 1998 and played in that Sharks side in 1998 where we, uh, we had a really good season in, in Super Rugby. And uh, at one stage, I think we were right up the top of that log and looking like we were going to host the semi-finals. And I'll never forget that. And I mean, I know I'm digressing here a little bit, but I'll never forget the uh, the game that we had to play last last round of Super Rugby, play the Crusaders at Kings Park. And uh, <laughs> Mac is another amazing coach, but I'll never forget that game beforehand. He said to us, he said, "You see that centre uh, storming Norman Berryman? He wouldn't even make our team. See, he's overweight, and look at our centres and our team." And, well, I think Storming Norman Berryman scored three tries against us in that game that day. And uh, it really was a game where if we'd won it, we'd play a home semi-final. If we lose it, we travel to to Christchurch and play an away semi-final against the same opponents. Um, so we ended up literally on the same pl uh, plane flights. And I still to this day don't know how they sort out those plane flights with two squads traveling all the way to New Zealand. And we managed to do it the next day. And we played there. We lost that game, but it was we had a so I, I, you know rugby was going well, but you get a couple of injuries and you don't get another opportunity, and you just got to keep per persevering with it. And uh, yeah, two, two, uh, in 1999, I tore my posterior cruciate, uh, and I was also having a really good run as far as my game was going, and uh, it ruled me out for the uh, probably the tail end of the Curry Cup, and. Uh, being able to get possibly into whatever selections, maybe, and but but it served a really good purpose, and I honestly believe with uh, with injuries as a player, sometimes those injuries come and they they can be a real blessing because what you end up doing is you end up spending time on other things that you haven't done as far as conditioning is concerned, and I was able to get myself really strong in the gym and uh, mentally fired up in that year 2000 and uh, when I came in 2000 I was like ready to run through a brick wall again and uh, had felt like my body had had a good good recovery um, and uh, yeah the results were lucky enough to get selected reselected back into the box and uh, funny enough to play that second game off the bench coming on in against the New Zealanders in Christchurch so yeah uh, it's, uh, it was again a really special experience. So. How good was it to be back? Awesome. Unbelievable. I mean, to to get on that field and then you you you, you have the, the hacker going on in front of you, and uh, to get that opportunity is just amazing. And uh, uh, you know, it's uh, it's what I mean. You you wearing the you got the, the the Springbok on your on your chest there, and uh, it's a childhood dream of uh, all. Of, I mean, most South Africans who want to play rugby, you know. So, uh, and my earliest recollection, and it's New Zealand resonates with me big time. Not one because my mother's a New Zealander, but also because. For my, my first rugby memory as a kid was watching the, um, the uh, tour in 1981 
to uh, to New Zealand, the the flower bomb series, and waking up with my, my both my mother and father early in the morning to watch to watch the rugby. And remember those days, TV wasn't arranged around or the games weren't arranged around TV. So those games would kick off at one o'clock in the afternoon in the in New Zealand, and it'd be early early in the morning in South Africa. And waking up watching those games, that's where the dream started. Warren, we lost that match against the All Blacks uh, in 2000. And in the week after that, we were playing against the Wallabies and we took quite a hiding against them as well. And I know that they were the world champions at the time. Nick Mallet had taken the Springboks on a 17-match winning streak. And then in 1999, we started losing a few games. That continued into 2000 when you returned. How happy was the Bok camp at that stage? Yeah, it was it was a tight knit block camp, but it's, remember, it's a, there's so much pressure on you. So once you start losing, it's uh, I remember Henry Honeyball, and Henry never said much, but he says just like when you come in there that Monday morning, something slides in under the door in the team room, something slides in under the door and just settles on your shoulders, and the so it just the weight just keeps keep setting. And uh, when you start when you're losing like that and you're in that cycle, it is it is really difficult to to break it, and it's important that you do break it. Um, and we were in this, you, you're losing this game. Now you travel, and we lost badly against Australia. And I'll never forget, after we lost badly, we had to go to an island off, uh, off uh, Queens, the Queensland coast in, um, in Brisbane. And uh, it was actually amazing. So we almost like went into this like little pre-season realignment training camp. And yes, we'd end up losing again against when we played the next game. Was, but we came together as a team, and if you go and ask that 2000 uh, squad about Corin Cove in Australia, they were all from Cornet to everyone. They, uh, Andre Force, they will all come back with keepers. That was tough because we went almost back into this, uh, back into this, uh, getting ourselves ready again and uh, resetting ourselves. And I think that was actually, you know, it was it it, it set us up and got us going again. And uh, we were to to beat the All Blacks a little bit later. At Ellis Park, and I honestly believe it all started there in Corin Cove, uh, in this little on this little island, beautiful island off uh, off Australia, where we went into a training camp. So you've gone and preempted what I was about to ask you next, that win over the All Blacks at Ellis Park, a famous victory for the Springboks, as it turns out. How special was it to be part of a memorable match like that? It's one of it's one of the highlights of my career, and you know, it's, I, I was sitting on the bench. And uh, for me, as a rugby player, to be involved against again against the All Blacks for me, and it all resonates and it's come through really. For me, that was always my measuring ground. When I, if I toured on Super Rugby and I was playing in, in Australia, New Zealand, I always saw it as an extra challenge, and it was something that I really wanted to front up and uh, you know and, and try to produce on in, in New Zealand. So to beat them at home at Ellis Park was amazing. Let me tell you, it was incredible. And I was sitting on the bench for that game. And uh, I think uh, I think I replaced Corne, and I came on. I think there were only 10, 10 minutes or so left in the game, but I came on at a crucial time because there was uh, we had a scr- there was a scrum feed about ten fifteen meters out from try line. New Zealand were feeding the ball in, and at that stage, and I don't know if you remember Ron Cribb, but Ron Cribb had the most amazing season in two thousand. He would go on to have uh, I think uh, a knee injury or ligament damage, and he never really recovered his form and never played again like he did in that year 2000. But he was probably the best number eight that I came up against. And remember, I was playing open side flank at the stage. So people say, who are you, are you playing against your open side flanker? Well, not really. I, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a flanker, especially open side flanker, I was almost coming up against the number eight because he's going to come around and try a break. I've got to try to stop him and I've got to be always aware of what he's doing. Um, so I knew I was coming onto that field 10, 15 metres out. New Zealand are feeding the ball in. Ron Cribb is going to come, and he's probably the best and the quickest off the base of that scrum in 2000. And I've got it, and I knew it was coming. So I ran on, and as I got on, old Oli Larue, good mate of mine, he was the loose set prop. And all he had was was an incredible, uh, incredibly gifted player, and also very, very naturally strong. And all he had the ability, he could hit in, keep his his back straight, and then he could almost just shift, just shift his hips out a little bit. And that would just get me, a little, and, he, and, and he'd only do it now and again. And I'd say, Oli, I need you here, bugger. You've got to give me that. Uh, and he'd swing his hips out a little bit. And then what I'd also do, and it's something I heard Small taught me back in, I think it was 1997. He, t- he basically said, wait, when you're under pressure at flank, you normally take your inside leg, you put, you put, you put that back, and you, 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 I, I reversed my feet position 
to the reverse of what a flanker normally does. And what it did is put my right foot forward, behind with my shoulder, but it just gave me an extra step, gives me that one step quicker to get off the base. And then, and it's, it's something as a, as a flanker, and I, sometimes the guys don't do it today, but you've got to push and get the throw. That's not what I was saying they don't do. But as an open side flanker, I would get down and push, but I'd also be as low as possible to try and see that ball moving through the scrum. And as soon as I saw the number eight's hands touch, I'm going. And it's probably the best, most, it's not, it wasn't the best tackle, but probably the most significant tackle I've ever made in my career because I was able to bring Ron Cribb down and because uh, he would have been a real, real threat from there. And then obviously he went on to win the game. So for me, it's a small little thing that most people who watch that game won't even have noticed. But for me, that was uh, just to make sure that I made that tackle and covered my position in that, in that, that minute that I came on. Um, so great memories, and uh, yeah, it was a special, a really special game. And I'm talking uh, holistically rugby uh, when I think of what it's done for me in my career and uh, the, the values that I've learned, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the following week, we very nearly pulled off another win against the world champion Wallabies at the time in Durban. I remember Bram van Straten kicking that penalty at the end, and we all thought that we had won it. But then the Aussies got their own penalty, I think it was a minute or two minutes later, whatever, and that was pretty much the last kick of the game. How heartbreaking was that? That was devastating because that game, again, from, for, from a personal point of view, I came out. Andre Forster was captain, playing number eight. He got injured, and I came on playing number eight in that second half, and I absolutely loved it. So it was my my one game where I got to play in my favourite position for the Springboks. So absolutely loved it, and we played damn well in that game. I really thought the box played. Uh, we threw everything out, and those Aussies there, you got to hand it out, hand it to them. They've got incredible BMT. They they can hang in, especially that that team from that generation could hang in and hang in, no matter how how well the opposition are playing. And uh, yeah, I'll never forget. I mean, there was a kick on the. I think it was five meters from the from the from the touchline um, on the on the seaward side of uh, of uh, of uh, Kings Park, uh, right up against that touchline on the halfway line. And it was Sterling Mortlock was kicking, and Sterling is a good mate of mine, but he hadn't got many kicks that that season. Well, he wasn't as accurate, but he absolutely nailed that kick, and uh, that kick basically. You know, it was that close that year that if we'd won that, because the New Zealanders had won their games at home, the Australians had won their games at home, and if because we, we'd beaten New Zealand the week before, we'd have beaten one our games at home, if you know what I'm saying. So uh, it was a very closely uh, contested series, and uh, because of that, I think Australia ended up uh, winning that um, winning that uh, that series, and uh, we ended up uh, getting the the wooden spoon, and that's where infamous, infamous, in, infamously uh, Nick Mallett lost his job after that. But literally, it hung on that kick. We missed that kick. We won the game, and we would have been right at the. Oh, I don't know if we would have been uh, right at the top with points differences and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it would have been very interesting then if we'd won. And uh, the guy certainly uh, uh, produced on, on that day. Small margins indeed. And you mentioned him there, Nick Mallett. Uh, Warren, earlier I asked you about Carl Duplessis. What can you tell us about Nick as a coach? So Nick was a, at that time. At that time in my rugby career, it was actually he was he was an inspirational coach for me because he was so hands on. And then I, I was learning. I felt like I was, you know, you get to Springbok level, and sometimes then you're not learning again. You're just trying to you're trying to fit into the system, and you're learning the calls and all that. But I suddenly felt that oh, I'm learning stuff here about rugby. I'm learning about the game. And Nick is so knowledgeable. Um, and we see that in super sport and uh, his presenting and stuff like that. That I, I started, I felt like, hey, I'm learning again in this game and, uh, on defensive patterns and how, what we had to do. So I really enjoyed enjoyed him that year, even though he was under incredibly under incredible pressure and uh, there was a lot of uh, you know tension and uh, we were losing one or two games, so it was difficult. Um, but I was I was enjoying the environment and. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I would, uh, I would go on a tour later that year, but it would be my last uh, actual test match. So I toured at the Springboks end of the season, but didn't get a test match. So it would be my last test match. But uh, yeah, what a what a what a pleasure to be involved. And how about his uh, successor, Harry Fulian? Yeah, actually, right. I, I got on the bench with Harry. I, I played against England, so I forgot about that. That was the end of December. So. Harry then was a total opposite, and he wanted to play this. He had this idea to play this free flowing game and. In Argentina, he said to the guys, you can't kick the ball. So I think uh, Percy, 
in the end, kicked it for the first time, I think 10 minutes into the second half or something like that. And the, the Argentines had really had worked out that the New Zealand, South Africans weren't going to kick. So he was very much a cavalier and quite prepared to take a bit of a gamble. And, uh, you know, he had his own style and panache. And, um, you know, it's a, for me, I take something out of, I, I'm always going to try to take something out of people that you interact with. And uh, I enjoyed it. It's, uh, you know, it, I, that would be my last season with the, with the box because I got, you know, I tore a calf muscle the next year quite badly and uh, battled to get back in the team. I had to do my rehab and never ever did, but uh, that's another matter. But, uh, yeah, I enjoyed that tour. And, uh, you know, I went on that tour with, uh, after the Curry Cup final, I picked up a big septic knee which uh, gave me problems for the first, I think, week or two of that tour. So I was literally like a tourist for the first two weeks trying to get my knee sorted. Um, but I uh, was able to play later in that tour, played against the, uh, I think it was the Welsh uh, A or Barbarian team, whatever they call it on the Wednesday, because those days we used to play midweek games and had a, nice, had a nice game in that game and then managed to make the bench against England the week after. Then we had the Barbarians after that, the week after that. So, yeah, great to play to, to, through, through Europe as well. All right, Warren, I'm going to test your memory a little bit here. I had AJ Fenter on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he told me about this bizarre incident that actually involved you, okay? It was against England at Twickenham, and the, the numbers may be a little bit off, so again, please correct me if, if I'm out. But the way that he described it was something as follows. With about four minutes to go, he was sent on as a replacement. And then approximately two minutes later, he was brought off the field and you went on in his place. Quite bizarre, something that you do not see happen, certainly not every day on a rugby field. And the way I understand it was that Harry Phil Yoon sent AJ on, but Andre Markroff, as the forwards coach, took him off and sent you on. What can you tell us about that? So I, I don't know, according to that, as to who sent who on and who did it. But the, AJ is 100% right. Maybe the timing's maybe not, but he's 100% right. So it was the strangest thing. So I, I, I think it was Corner again. Corner took a knock in the first half. And I got a message came down to me and said to me, Bros, you've got to warm up. You're going onto the field. So I promise you, I'm running up and down the touchline, getting myself, and all the other guys are sitting there getting myself ready because they say I'm going on. So I'm doing my stuff, it gets to like 35 minutes. So there's like five minutes to go before half time. Again, the guy said, no, no, you're going to go, you go. So bang, I'll go running and trying to warm myself up. I don't go on in the first half. Second, at half time, I'm standing in the in the change room and I can't remember who spoke to me, whether it's Harry or Andre Markroff, I don't know. But they came up to me and said, listen, bros, within 10 minutes, you're on the field in the second half. Just keep yourself warm. <laughs> so I run out, the guys run out to the field. I run behind the behind the poles. I'm like doing all these exercises, getting myself warmed up, thinking I'm going on in 10 minutes' time. Come back with like 10 minutes to go on and so I sit down on the bench. I don't go on. So I like sit and I sit. And then I get, and I get another, someone else says, bros, you need to keep yourself warm. So about 20 minutes ago, I run off and away I go to warm up again. And uh, I come, and again, I don't go back, I don't go on the field. So I get back to the thing. And then the next thing I see, I'm sitting there and then AJ runs out. So I go, what the, what, what's going on here? I don't know what's going on. So I'm like sitting and I thought, okay, well, I'll just put my stuff down. Thought, okay, well, that's, that's me done. I'm not running on. And literally, like AJ said, whether it was two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, I don't know. I'm not really worried. But he, AJ was pulled off. AJ's running towards me like his big eyes. is going like this. I'm going, I don't know. Either we high five each other and I ran onto the field. So, yeah, that, was, that would be my last uh, game for the box, by the way. So as far as a test match is concerned. Yeah, so AJ's right, and uh, yeah, it's a crazy, crazy thing. I literally warmed up that whole game um, and got about two, three, four minutes uh, against the English. Unbelievable, actually, isn't it? So Warren, I want to ask you this, um, because it, it appears as if there may have been some kind of tension or maybe a conflict of interest even between Harry Filune and Andre Markroff. Was there anything that you picked up on? Yeah, I just, you know, it's, I wouldn't say I'm not going to go between Andre and, and Harry because, yes, that, and it could well have been. But I, what I will say is I think there were, there were just so many coaches on that tour. So there would be, um, you'd have Harry, but there'd be Ian Max in the background. I even think Heineken Mayer might have been there. there was, Peter de Villiers might have been. There. And if you actually go through all our Springbok coaches and you go look at who was on in that traveling party, it's it's Jake White, I think, was the technical guy. I mean, there was it was just amazing all the guy, all the personnel that were there, 
And so from that point of view, it must have been, you know, I think, you know, they're all saying too many cooks spoil the broth. Um, probably was uh, was true, but uh, yeah, it's that's that, it could well have been. And then, as you said, that was the end of your Springbok Test career. How disappointed were you that it ended there? Yeah, I was disappointed because you know it's 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 weird. Like uh, I was able to get myself back after that. Cause I had a, had a had a bad calf injury where I tore my my soleus muscle, and uh, you know you you tear your calf and you think oh that's not too bad and you'll be back. But it's uh, the muscle fibers are quite coarse, so you got actually. You got to actually be careful with it because you can end up it can end up causing you a bit of grief. So it, it took longer to recover than I thought because I probably trying to come back too early um, with it. Um, so it, it 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 ruined my it was a 2001 season after I played. I think I played all the was involved in the Super Rugby and just before the the week before the semi finals it was actually the game against the you support them the, the Stormers. Yeah, and it was the one that we played down in uh, in. Um, in the in the bullet at uh, and uh, uh, where Robbie Fleck, I think he got tackled from behind by Dion Kaiser famously and in that game, and I came on and I was actually carrying the injury and was put on the bench for that, and I came on and the, and the minute I got on again, I did the same thing because I knew the number eight could uh, could break, and he did break, and I put all my weight through my left leg where my calf was, and I think that's where I just. I tore it properly because then I was like running with like a floppy foot. I couldn't, but I had to stay on the field. Um, but uh, yeah, it was disappointing not to get you know, get back in again. I would go over to uh, Ulster, play play there for a couple seasons in uh, Northern Ireland, and had a good run of form there as well. And then also picked up a bit of a shoulder injury. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's you know it's, it's a it's a window in your life, and you've got to take it when you when it gets offered. You don't never know when you're going to get your next test match. And I wasn't to get another one. And uh, yes, it was disappointing, but uh, it's a game that's rewarded me so much as far as. Uh, you know, all the as I've mentioned, I mean, the 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 the, the, the reason we play this game is just amazing. And uh, even today, I'm probably going to end up going down to the beach and going to go play some touch rugby. I'm over 50 now, but we want to keep ourselves active. And uh, you know, it's just all the guys come together and uh, have fun, and it's it's so good. As you mentioned, there it's a window of opportunity, and with that in mind, Warren. I think that there are a lot of kids in South Africa that grow up dreaming of becoming Springboks. And part of that dream, I think, involves them at least thinking that they will play 50 tests or 100 tests. Their career will last for a decade. But as it turns out, in your example, you only played six test matches and five of those were actually off the bench. What would your advice be to those kids? Oh, geez. My, my first of all, my advice would be write down your goals. Write them down. I mean, I, 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 my father made me do it when I was about 12, 13 years of age, and I split academics and sport because he said, oh, I wanted to just do sport, of course. He said, no, no, there's got to be another half academics. And it's amazing how those things that you write down end up coming true. I mean, I, I, said, I said on that because Ray Mort and Rob Lowe had just gone to go play rugby league for Wigan, and I, suddenly I thought, hey, you can, you, can earn a, you can earn money playing this game because they were doing it. So I thought, okay, I want to play rugby league. Then I put, I want to play for the Springboks. And so I and the same on my academic side. And it's amazing. I spent a year playing rugby league in Australia and uh, also then uh, obviously played for the box. But you know what? Set that goal and you never know where it's going to take you. And uh, uh, it's so, so important. And you can go and do it. You know, it's there were a lot more players, far more talented than I ever was that I would always say. But one thing, I was prepared to put the work in. I was prepared to go. And, and, and if you're prepared to do that and you've got some talent to match and you've got a love and passion for the game, you don't know where that can take you. And uh, my big thing is with players now, we've got so many good schoolboys in this country and uh, do they get lost afterwards? And how do they get in if they don't get into a Varsity Cup team? Or what's their pathway through if they don't get picked up by a franchise? And uh, there are opportunities to do it, but it's very, very difficult nowadays. So it's, it's, we don't want to lose those players because we've got such a great, uh, you know, uh, there's a, like a, it's almost like a tap that just keeps running. There's a talent that comes into this country. Um, but if you persevere, stick with it, man, it can happen quickly. I mean, look at like someone like Dion Ferree from the, from the Stormers. Um, you know, you could, uh, he's a great analogy for me. I mean, uh, what an amazing guy. I mean, you look at him, you stand there, I stand next to him and he's small, but he's a flanker and he's made an impact in this game and he was able to come on in the World Cup final and literally play that whole game, 76, 77 minutes at hooker where he hadn't played there for so many years. And he's the oldest guy to have debuted as a spring ball. He was playing in France in Division Two rugby, finished. He thought he was done. 
Came back to South Africa, Dobbo throws him a contract, says, come and help us out a bit, goes on to get his debut. Now, if he hadn't persevered, he'd never, ever have been able to become a Springbok. So I think it's a great analogy to use to the, a lot of the youngsters out there um, with a guy like Dion Free that's current and, uh, and playing. It's a wonderful example. Uh, Warren, I ask all of my guests who their toughest opponent was when they were playing. I know you touched on Ron Cribb quite a bit, a little bit earlier. Was it him or was there someone else? No, uh, it's been too sweet, but I didn't see him as my toughest opponent. So, you know, my, tough, my toughest opponent was myself. Without a shadow of a doubt, it was myself. And um, the, big, the big thing about playing, like uh, you mentioned AJ, so I played against AJ and we had many battles together. Then we became teammates. Um, I... I I wouldn't want to give too much respect to the guy that I'm playing as. I would, obviously, I do respect him, and I know he's a good player, but I'm not going to say, well, he's the greatest player and I'm going to battle against him because I've actually got to go tackle him, I've got to drive him backwards, and I've got to measure myself against him. So for me, as a, as a, as a, as a youngster, Buck Shelford was the guy that I like. Uh, that was He was tough and he could play, and I would love to be. I mean, a Buck Shelford was incredible. For me, that was inspirational. But for my biggest opponent was probably myself. I mean, you could... I could lose, you can lose confidence and then you can't play the game. Then you suddenly you knock a ball on and you're not, and it's, it's what's up here. And I think it's the analogy of probably the golfers and the tennis players that are out there by themselves and how mentally strong they've got to be. And that's the most important thing. And uh, there were times when I felt like I could run through a brick wall and no one's going to stop me. Why couldn't I be like that all the time? That was the, that was the, that, that, that is, that is, that is the big thing because but this is an attritional game. So, you you know, if you keep running into a brick wall, no matter who you are, even if you're Peter Steph Toy or you, you know, whoever it is, the bone collector, eventually your body starts to take a pounding. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it is, it, I think my biggest opponent was probably uh, myself and to keep myself mentally on track. And uh, that, was, that was the big thing. Is there a particularly funny moment that you can share with us from your time with the Springboks? Yeah, you know, difficult. I suppose if, if Rob Kempson was here, he would tell the story. So I will do it for Rob Kempson. I was, and it wasn't with the Springboks, but we were playing in the Celtic Cup semi final, not Celtic Cup, the, the Magda, whatever it was called, a semi final, and we're playing against Munster. And I think it was happening on the 2nd or 3rd of Jan, just after New Year's. Uh, so you know, what the, you know what the weather's like in Ireland. Um, and we, 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 we got captains, we went allowed on the, on the main pitch for captains. Uh, captain's run. So we're practicing on the field next door, but it's like an old dilapidated field. Nothing like it. It's in Ireland and it's a little field and it didn't have uh, padding around the pole, poles. And we do, we do, we're doing our run through moves. We get to the 22 and we do, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget it. You remember when Peter Rousseau scored that, I don't know if you remember, Peter Rousseau scored that try against New Zealand in Wellington, running on that angle with a switch and playing that inside ball. So we did this move. And I was coming on the inside ball, I'm coming at 100 miles an hour and uh, running it. And I, and I run up to the try line. And as I get to the try line, I think that it actually could be nice now to pass the ball to some, one of my other teammates just so they can pretend like they scored. So as I do that, I look inside like this. I think it might have been even Rob Kempson or someone. I pop the ball up so he can just like fall out of the line. But I didn't look up. The, the rugby ball pole was here. It cut me in my head here. So the whole team were on the ground laughing. The pole was shaking like this. And I was lying on the floor, massive big gash across my, my eyebrow here. Yeah? I was concussed. And I'm lying on the floor. They take me, they take me off. They carry on the captain's practice. Eventually, all the guys get on the bus. I must have, I, don't, I think they waited for like 10, 15 minutes for me. And then eventually, I get on and the guys just packed out laughing when I got on the bus. And then it was, it was early also in our, my relationship with my wife, uh, Nicola, who is obviously, she's not here now, but... She, 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 we'd, we just got married. We we just got married and she was expecting me to phone her because I said, I'll phone you straight after captains. I didn't phone her. And then she got so worried. So she was like phoning, couldn't get it. And she was like, she was like sending me, why aren't you giving me a call? And then Robbie got to take the call. And then uh, he was my roommate. So it was just, uh, no, he absolutely loved it because I got into, I got into shit from my wife. I had his big cut. I ran onto the onto that on, in that game the next day. I ran on. I couldn't see out my left eye. It was all strapped up, but it actually ended up breaking my my wrist. And I think it was because I couldn't. It was I, I tackled someone, and I probably didn't time it correctly because I couldn't see out my left eye. So I probably shouldn't have played in the game. But uh, yeah, he, he to this day, he, if he sees me, he'll remind me about that uh, that rugby pole. That's a great story. So Warren, is there a current player who you admire? So. I mean, number one, Peter Steph de Toy, I mentioned him. I think he's amazing. Uh, Malcolm Marks, 
I really, and I'm, I'm talking from a South African point of view. Um, uh, I think Malcolm Marx is incredible, and I think uh, from if we were robbed of not having him at the World Cup, and to have still gone on and won that World Cup is a real testimony. But I think he is just an amazing player, uh, holding that whole scrub together, and what he can do on the ground, and the, uh, the way he he does what he does. And then there's a lot of that that whole South African team at the moment's got got legends that are going to be remembered from Chisholm Colby. Um, I think a future le- legend, Damien Phillips, uh, um, the whole, all of them. I mean, uh, Damien De uh, uh, what Pollard did. It's it's a it's an incredible generation of players that's been led incredibly well by Russell Erasmus. Um, so it's out of that current crop, there are so many. Eben Etzebeth is just an absolute freak. I mean, he's going. I mean, God willing, he should go on and play the most Test matches for South Africa by a country mile. Um, He's just incredible. He means his physical ability, his athletic ability, and then his uh, his BMT for the big match as well. So, you know, he's got a, he's got everything. Um, so it's just you, you you can go through that whole team, and uh, there are players in every position from what Faf does on the on the pitch as a number nine. Um, so I think yeah, and I still believe I honestly believe we're going to be looking good for the next World Cup as well. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I love it. I endorse everything that you just said there. Uh, Warren, uh, we've obviously, we see you and hear you on Supersport. Um, what else are you up to these days? Yeah, so I've got my own outdoor advertising company um, that I've got, that uh, got sites up in Johannesburg, got six uh, digital boards up there, and got a got a handful, or a couple of static boards as well. So that's what keeps me busy. And uh, you know, I'm off now to a meeting with uh, one of the town planners to try and work on a site that I'm trying to develop down here in Cape Town. So, yeah, it's what it's what I do. And then obviously to get the advertising on those boards, I've got a bespoke company. I don't, so I don't, I don't want to be massive. I just want to have you know, 20, 24 really good uh, boards scattered around the country. Um, and uh, that's what keeps me busy at the moment. And then obviously family man, and, uh, got two beautiful kids and a beautiful wife and uh, been very blessed and uh, just – Moved down to the Cape, so it's a new journey for me as well, and my family and uh, kids. My daughter's just gone into a BCom marketing uh, degree, and son's just started at Paul Boys. So it's all exciting times for the uh, Brosnian family at the moment. Sounds good to me. Let's finish off by looking again at that trivia question from earlier. In 2013, the Springboks played a test match at the Mbombela Stadium for the first time. Who were the opponents that day? Do you know the answer, Warren? I think Richie McCaw was the captain, man. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, New Zealand. So we did play New Zealand at Mbombela, but that was in 2022. You remember? Oh, remember was it the next there? one? Yes, yes, yes. So we're going back to 2013. Was it not? You sure? New Zealand, we didn't play New Zealand there. Who was it? Australia, then. The correct answer, in fact, Warren, believe it or not, is Scotland. Scotland. Cheapest. I would never have got that. But I'm sure we played. Uh, no, 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 Bell, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, mixed up with uh, Royal Buffer King. And I'm thinking of the Royal Buffer King Stadium. That's exactly what I'm thinking. I wasn't even thinking of him, Bell. Sorry. No, <laughs> Scotland's 100% right. I was thinking of Royal Buffer King when Richie McCall. Yeah, okay, I made a mistake. No, that's listen, quite... It's important to listen. <laughs> that's quite right. Royal Buffer King, that was the one where Andre Pretorius kicked that penalty right at the end to, to win it for us. Yeah. We ended up winning it, so it was a crucial game for us to win. That's what I, I had in my head from 2013. Okay. So, yeah, and then obviously Scotland, uh, South Africa, 2013, Bombela. And then you'll remember this. Italy and Samoa were here as well. For It was a sort of four-nation competition, and the two of them played the curtain raiser before that. So, actually, they played the first test match that was ever played at Mbombela. And let me tell you, that test match, New Zealand test match that we had in Mumbela, when was it, 2022? Yeah. I think I went there as a spectator. It was magnificent. It was such a great atmosphere in that stadium. Uh, easy access, easy exit, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. It was an incredible. Obviously, the Springboks played well, it helps, but uh, it was just, uh, just an incredible game. It really does help when they play well and win like that. Warren, let me say, it was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby today. An absolute pleasure to listen to those old stories from uh, back in the day. And I hope that we can have you on again in the future. Uh, Be my absolute pleasure. And thank you, Peter. Keep up with the great work and uh, the job that you do. Last time on Front Row Rugby, I had former Springbok hard man Andre Fenter on the show. You can go and watch that video. It's appearing on your screen right now. Next time, I'll have another former Springbok flank, F. Sears Smith, as a guest.